Wajo, Wache and Ain. Welcome to Lakehead University's Treaty Recognition Week with keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Amy Kraft, living Indigenous governance through understanding and implementing treaty relationships. We are happy that you are able to join us today. Denise Baxter and Dishnikos, Makwadodam, Martin Falls and Donjaba. My name is Denise Baxter, Vice Provost Indigenous Initiatives at Lakehead University, and I will be your MC for the event today. Lakehead University, respectfully acknowledges its campuses are located on the traditional lands of Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robertson Spirit Treaty area of 1850. And Lake Ketarilia is located on the territory of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. In Lakehead's commitment to social justice and social responsibility, we advance the truth and reconciliation calls to action um, and the University's Canada principles on Indigenous education. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendation to build capacity for intercultural understanding, empathy, and mutual respect has become a guiding principle for the commitments Lakehead has made in both Northwestern Ontario and Simcoe County, and will continue to guide our efforts in the future. Before we begin, I would like to share an important notice of video recording of the Treaty Recognition Week events. Participants are reminded that this online event is being recorded. And we are doing this to preserve a record of the event in the university's archives and to publicize and promote Lakehead University. By attending, you are agreeing to be included in the recording and its public dissemination in any media now known or later developed anywhere in the world in perpetuity. And Dr. Kraff has agreed to have today's um, event recorded. And so I will put the chat in the chat pod. Uh, it should be posted within 48 hours on our YouTube channel so that you can go back and, and watch it, which I, I know many people do um, because there's a lot of good information that we, we get. And it's nice to hear it more than once. Um, today, if you have any questions, we will have time at the end. You can please put them in the chat pod and uh, Dr. Kraft will uh, respond to those at that time. It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Dr. Amy Kraft is an award-winning teacher and researcher recognized internationally as a leader in the area of Indigenous laws, treaties, and water. She holds a university research chair, Nibi Minowa Aki. Oh, I should have read this longer. My <laughs> job is not very great. Um, in a kick a, uh, let me say this. Inakoganiawin, Indigenous Governance in Relationship with Land and Water. An Associate Professor at the Faculty of Common Law, University of Ottawa, and an Indigenous Anishinaabe Métis lawyer from Treaty One Territory in Manitoba. She is the former Director of Research at the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, and the founding director of research at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. She practiced at the Public Interest Law Center for over a decade. In 2016, she was voted one of the top 25 most influential lawyers in Canada. And in 2021, she was awarded the prestigious Canadian Bar Association President's Award. Professor Kraft prioritizes Indigenous-led and interdisciplinary research, including through visual arts and film, co-leads a series of major research grants on decolonizing water governance and works with many Indigenous nations and communities in Indigenous relationships with and responsibilities to Nabi, which is water. She plays an important role in international collaborations relating to transformative memory in colonial contexts and relating to the reclamation of Indigenous birthing practices as expressions of traditional sovereignty. Breathing Life into the Stone Fort Treaty, her award-winning book, focuses on understanding and interpreting treaties from the Anishinaabe and Akikowin legal perspective. Treaty Words, her critically acclaimed children's book, explains treaties, philosophy, and relationships. She is past chair of the Aboriginal Law Section of the Canadian Bar Association and a current member of the Speaker's Bureau of the Treaty Relations Commission in Manitoba. Amy's presentation will review elements of Indigenous laws and governance that were part of the treaty making and that will continue to inform how we understand and implement treaties today. Welcome, Amy. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. Um, Denise, I, I'd much rather be in person. I love being in Thunder Bay um, and I have been to your university many times and uh, uh, miss traveling actually, but uh, glad to see everyone here and hopefully that means that more of you are able to join us because we're in this uh, this online format. 
Um, what I would say though is uh, remembering that treaties have deep resonance with people and land so that um, what you're what we're talking about today, what we're thinking about collectively in this this time and space has to have some resonance in those relationships and in that land. So if you can put that into action after we spend this time together today, um, that would be ideal. Um, and you can do that in, in whatever way you, uh, you feel is right. And uh, I'll, I'll share some ideas of how I think you might do that towards the end of the talk today. And we'll also reserve some time for questions and discussion. So, Buju and Dinu Maganiduk, Kiwait no Dinu Koyendishnikaz, Mikanaki Koyendishnikaz, Ojawashko Beneshi, Indigo, Mangan and Dodem. I'm joining you from Treaty One territory uh, in Manitoba. The sun is shining today, so that's always a good thing, and it's nice to be in my home territory uh, to speak about uh, treaties. When I uh, agreed to, to speak with you today, um, I knew this was going to be a busy week and there's so much going on and I did want to do something for Treaty Recognition Week because I think it's so significant. Um, I think that there are people, I, I thought I would just be talking to a small group from Lakehead, there are many of you and I think that there are some of you that are even from different regions and um, I'm hoping that a lot of this will resonate beyond um, geopolitical boundaries, beyond treaty territories, into understanding treaty relationships wherever it is that you are, whichever land that uh, you're situated on. Um, so as I said, I'm in, in Treaty 1 territory. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, all of the different treaties and their um, treaty making people and the history of those treaties and their specific context. Um, I was really fortunate in my younger life and continuing today to sit with uh, knowledge keepers in relation to treaties and a lot of the work that I do starts from those foundations and the teachings and knowledge that um, I acquired in those in those spaces um, and that I was given a responsibility to uh, share. And one of the things that I was told, um, there's, you know, I remember one specific space in which uh, I was told that I had to share a story, um, a story of treaty. And I, I'd always seen myself as a learner. Uh, and I think that that's a good thing. I think we're all continuously and always learning more about the treaty relationship. Um, I work in uh, Anishinaabe uh, law and Canadian law. Um, my discipline is law, but I do a lot of interdisciplinary work. And I remember thinking that lawyers originally, you know, as I as I started my career, the lawyers had to have this objectivity and they couldn't be centered in relationships. And very quickly I was corrected in terms of bringing it back to, you know, you are part of these relationships and you have to act like a treaty partner at, at all times. And I think that that was a really good teaching in terms of taking up responsibility um, as a treaty person in, um, you know, despite uh, sort of disciplinary lines that would be drawn. I want to acknowledge also that uh, I've seen the names of a few of my Medewan sisters, so it's nice to see you and uh, some of my colleagues. So thank you so much for, for joining us today and, um, and taking the time to engage deeply with treaty and uh, the idea of governance and, and implementation. I, I looked back at the title and I thought, oh, that's a little bit dry. I could have probably made it a little bit more exciting, but I believe that it truly is because this is the, the time that we're at uh, collectively thinking about what the implications of treaties are and, and how we see them, how we understand them, and then how we mold them into the exercise of our relationships today. And that means the exercise of relationships with the lands, territories, waters that we collectively belong to. And I'm going to include settlers in belonging to land and territory. And that's one of the major distinctions that I want to draw for our purposes today is that this idea of ownership of land is not uh, an Anishinaabe idea. It's not a Cree idea. It's very much imported from a Western perspective. And part of the challenge of making treaties that are so focused that, you know, at the time of making treaties that were so focused on land acquisition and land ownership is that we were talking very different languages. Uh, well, are they, I wasn't there. They were talking very different languages at the time, um, you know, talking about ownership and having a response from Anishinaabe and others saying, we don't own the land. But that didn't mean that that land was open to be. Um, owned by someone else. 
it actually meant that there was a distinct relationship um, and it wasn't opening up space for ownership by someone else. It was a belonging to land. So when I said earlier, I wish you know, I wish you to go out after and, and think about those relationships. What is the land that you belong to? What are your sets of responsibilities that you have in relation to that territory? And think about the moments in time where treaties were made and what that would have looked like. Um, part of the, the work that I do and the approach that I take, the framework that I use, is thinking about Indigenous laws and legal orders as fundamental to treaty making. They were the, the law that was brought into the making of treaty. And part of the making of that treaty actually confirms that idea of um, belonging to uh, land, land and territory. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, the objective of the crown in making treaties uh, very early on, peace and friendship in the East, sort of in the early days, but where you're situated um, in Northwestern Ontario on the, on the Great Lakes in the Robinson Huron and uh, Robinson Superior areas and in the Western uh, numbered treaties, the objective is really land and resources acquisition. And that connects to what I was just saying in terms of land ownership and belonging to land. And I think now we need to reframe those ideas and come back to original intentions of uh, indigenous people, of Anishinaabe, of Cree and others in their treaty making so that we can have uh, just relationships that reflect the treaties that were made today. And why do we need to do that? I was interviewed very early this morning on CBC and you know, what's the importance of treaties? Why do we have a treaty recognition week? And basically I'm gonna boil it down to one, you know, what I've told, have been told is a harsh comment. Um, but if we do, were to do away with treaties, Let's say we were to invalidate them, and, and I've had this proposed to me. Let's start over. You know, let's put aside those old treaties, those misunderstandings. Let's start afresh. My response to that, and that of many uh, others, I think, is if that's well, first of all, it's not possible because these treaties engage with the creator, and they were done in ceremony. So that's a first response. But that's kind of centered on indigenous values and perspectives. The more pragmatic response to it is treaties are the only thing that allows for legitimate settler presence in the territory. So without those treaties, there is no legitimate settler presence. And so my direct and maybe blunt, uh, what I was told was harsh response um, is, where are settlers going to live while we're renegotiating these treaties that allowed for presence and in the territory and sharing of the land? And that quickly gets us back to a position of equality um, and uh, it might not be equality, but a position where Indigenous people are um, have a, a serious stake to play in how the treaty relationship is going to be moving forward. And I think that's really important to remember is that treaties are you know, the, the substantiation of this presence within territory. And we need to take that seriously and to develop those relationships and think about what relationships of sharing actually mean. Um, and that has pretty significant implications for uh, governance of lands, territories and waters, but also in relation to citizenship and education and health, right? All of those things come into this um, this, this treaty umbrella, um, if you wish, and it, it informs, um, you know, how we need to rethink those relationships. And I want to premise this in saying, like, a lot of my work is um, taking direction from the TRC's calls, calls to action, the TRC's definition of reconciliation. I think those things hold a lot of promise, and a very critical eye to how Canadian law has misinterpreted and misapplied the treaties. So, you know, a lot of people blend two ideas, interpretation and implementation. And I'd like to suggest that we need to think about those two things differently. Treaty interpretation is one thing, how we interpret and understand them and how we implement them is a very um, significant other event in, um, you know, post-treaty uh, governance. Um, and in all of that, you know, I think we also need to remember that how treaties were made included both procedural and substantive elements. So when treaties were made, you know, there were 
significant parts of uh, procedural law, indigenous laws and legal orders that help make those treaties and then provide the substance for the types of agreements that would be made. So if we look back to, for example, the negotiations of Treaty 1, uh, which is the work that I did in, in the book that I published, um, Breathing Life into the Stone Fort Treaty, uh, this is based on knowledge that was uh, from the archives, from elders that I worked with, some understanding of Anishinaabe law, and bringing these things together to get a sense of how treaty could be understood differently than just a written text. Why do we want to go beyond a written text? Well, the written text is basically a set of instructions that was given to treaty commissioners from Ottawa and transported on a train to Treaty 1 territory after the Anishinaabe asked for treaty to be made, asked the Lieutenant Governor for a treaty. That actually surprises people to know that Anishinaabe asked for treaty, but they knew that there was pressure within the territory for land and resources. So this set of instructions that travels you know, on a train from Ottawa ends up being the document that's signed. But that's why we talk about treaty making rather than treaty signing, because there's nine days of negotiations of Treaty 1 that actually inform what the agreement is rather than the piece of paper that made its way on that train ride. Um, what's interesting too is there's a specific context for each treaty negotiation. And if you look at the numbered treaties, they look very similar in their written form. The negotiations were very different from one another. And so to think that the written text give a, gives us a sense of what the treaty is, is a false idea. And one that has been interpreted in a way that privileges the crown understanding. But if we take a step back from that and look at the specific context of negotiation, how Indigenous laws informed the treaty negotiations, the process that was followed, the procedural law. In Treaty 1 negotiations, we actually have the, um, uh, the representatives of the Anishinaabe as saying, you know, we have to wait for the others. We can't speak for them. They have the jurisdictional authority over their own people and their own territory. We can't uh, interfere with that. So this concept of non-interference is very clear from the start and the idea that certain people belong to certain territories. So although they say we don't own the land, we belong to the land, there's still kind of this jurisdictional authority that's affirmed right at the start of treaty negotiations in Treaty 1. So they say we have to wait. Plus you also have to do gifting and feasting. You have to follow our protocols of how we enter into a relationship of kinship together. And so that becomes an important procedural element of how each of the treaties are negotiated, um, as well as the pipe and tobacco being offered as being integral to how um, both the, uh, the, the both the treaties the treaty parties come together, but also the discussions and um, considerations that are taking place within the camps with the people on the land. In Treaty 1, there's a camp of a thousand people outside the fort during the treaty negotiations. Uh, in Treaty 3, it took multiple years to negotiate. And the, the idea was we need to go back into our families, into our communities, into our territories and talk to the people. We don't have the authority to enter into this relationship without them. So non-interference and the idea of jurisdictional authority within certain territories are present right at the start. The idea that there's a sacred relationship being developed, one of kinship, those are things that are put forward very clearly in most of the treaty negotiations uh, throughout Turtle Island. And when we think to the normative implications of that, so what we might refer to as substantive legal principles, we draw out that kinship as, as bringing um, equality, uh, love, kindness, and caring in the relationship to the mother, the queen, and in, in the um, Robinson treaties and in the numbered treaties. And thinking about that deep equality amongst all of the queen's children, which is an affirmation that's made by treaty commissioners uh, in the negotiations. What's interesting in Treaty 1, for example, um, Treaty 1 negotiations is that uh, the commissioners ask the um, representatives or chiefs from uh, the different groups within the Treaty 1 territory to um, map out the territories that they would like to keep with the idea of reserves being in mind. What they end up drawing out is two-thirds of the province of Manitoba at the time. 
And what's interesting is the commissioners kind of reject that idea, but they never come back to it. Uh, the commissioners, one of the commissioners actually says, well, if that's the case, if you're going to have most of the territory, I'd rather be one of you than the, the settlers or the crown. And that never actually gets resolved anywhere on the written record or in the oral history record. So the idea of you know, parcels of land as reserves that people must live on is a false one. The other issue that comes up in the treaty negotiations is the commissioners say, the queen will set aside these reserves um, if you choose to enter into agriculture and your way of life will be preserved otherwise. So there's no requirement to live on the reserve and there's a protection of a way of life that's built into the treaty promises that are made in the negotiations of the treaty. Um, do not look up the written text right now and try and find that because you won't, um, but that's a mistake. That's a mistake in, um, I would say it's, bad lawyering, it might be underhanded. Let's just call it not a reflection for the, our purposes, not a reflection of the agreement that was made. And I think that that's really significant because, um, you know, one of you, I'm, I'm looking at, you have a treaty medal in your, um, in, in your display, in your, in your image, uh, Robert, and that relationship, that shaking of hands is so uh, incredibly significant. And one of the things that courts have done is to look at the concept of common understanding as being a cornerstone of how we interpret treaties. But I actually think that we should look at what are not common understandings or what may have been understood to be common understandings by some of the parties or both of the parties, but that actually are based in different normative values and have different normative connotations then and today. So what does that actually mean? Well. One good example of that actually comes up in the Treaty 1 negotiations where the commissioners are saying, the queen, your mother, is very happy that you didn't ally with the Métis and the resistance. Um, she wants to enter into treaty with you, will treat you equally with all of her other children. Um, and so there's this deep kinship relationship building that's, that's going on in terms of looking at the queen as a mother. And so the Anishinaabe are, not, I'm assuming, nodding their heads and the commissioners are talking about mother and the, the Anishinaabe um, representatives say, you know, when we hear your words, we hear our mother. So there's, there's this building of this kinship relationship through the treaty negotiations. And when I did my, my graduate work, I, I worked with some elders to unpack this idea of the queen as a mother. And the early response that I got, and some of you will know this from listening to um, some of your elders, um, is that they said, we don't like this idea. Uh, the queen is not, our, we don't have a good relationship with the queen or with Canada. And that's, I think, part of the 150 year history of this particular treaty relationship is it hasn't been implemented in the way it was intended. But it, when we started to unpack this idea of mother and the agreement to this kinship relationship, what we were able to, um, to decipher is that both parties were agreeing to this relationship mother and mother is a universal concept. Everyone, every being in the world has a mother. Um, and we could presume that the understanding is the same, but the agreement had two different interpretive lenses. The queen's representatives, the commissioners were talking about mother as this um, authority and entity that was responsible for non-entities, right? So children in British law at the time didn't have legal personhood. They were considered wards of their parents. Parents decided for them. And then at a magical age, they become whole persons. Um, there were differences between older children and younger children and male children and female children. Children's labor was being sold and regulated in British markets. And so, you know, that's when the, the the commissioners are saying mother and they're extending their hand and building this relationship. That's what they have in their mind. Okay, that is not what Anishinaabe had in their mind at the time of making that treaty. And many of you will know this in, by the way we raise children now, how we think of children as these whole beings, not in Canadian law, but in Anishinaabe law, as whole entire beings with this relationship of equality with all of their siblings, cousins, with adults, 
uh, elders with other younger people. There's this deep sense of lateral, equal lateral equality. No one's above or below. And that's very significant in terms of understanding how this relationship of kinship was developed in the treaty. So we have this uh, agreement, mother, but the Anishinaabe perspective is one of equality. But that the mother herself is going to um, ensure the well being of her child and foster their independence. So there's not just equality, there's actually a role for the mother in. Um, making sure that the child has everything that they need and making sure that they will be autonomous and helping them, not just making sure they will be, helping them in, to realize their autonomy. So what does that mean? Okay, let's translate that into the, today's terms. That means deep self-determination as governance. Entrance into the Stone Fort and Treaty 1 and other treaty negotiations saying, can interfere with others, uh, we recognize their authority when there's dark clouds over our negotiations. This is language that's used, like imprisoning our people. They must be released before we can enter into this relationship. We're going to follow our protocols of feasting and gifting to make this relationship true. We're going to use our ceremonies as part of negotiating those relationships, those thousand people in camp. Those were discussions and ceremonies that were taking place on, on the Anishinaabe side of those negotiations. So that, you know, import that into today, that's preserving self-determination and jurisdiction over lands, territories, citizenship, people, um, and, you know, affirming that relationship of uh, autonomy and ensuring that autonomy going forward. Um, so I think that those are really important things to remember. And it wasn't as though that was a big surprise in the Treaty 1 negotiations in this sense. There, one of the reporters for the Treaty Commission Party, Molyneux St. John, actually said, we left the treaties, uh, the treaty negotiation, the Anishinaabe thinking one thing, the commissioners thinking another. So that says right from the start that there's a difference in understanding. Treaty one had to be renegotiated a few years later. The annuity was increased. There were outside promises that had been written out, but never actually added to the treaty document. And then in my view, there's this whole other body of promises that were made that are the intention of the treaty that never have made their way into the interpretation and implementation of the treaty. Okay, 150 years, in some cases, 150 years plus, what do we do about that today? Um, courts have tended to, now I'm going to shift to like, the problems with interpretation, but I won't spend too much time on that because I think that that's a problem that lawyers and legal um, thinkers like me have to deal with. I think it's important for everyone to be aware of them. Um, courts have often restricted and narrowly interpreted um, and looked at very textual approaches. But there have been some openings in the case law to look at treaties as you know, solemn promises that are to be interpreted um, where there's ambiguity in favor of Indigenous people. And all of these principles have kind of, I think, been directed to a more honest treaty interpretation and implementation. Somehow the results, though, at the end often look like a backward slide in terms of actually understanding the depth of treaty. There are some exceptions, and I think that the case law is starting to uh, adjust in terms of more deeply engaging with, with Anishinaabe and other Indigenous nations' understandings of treaty and applying Indigenous laws and legal orders to both the interpretation and implementation of treaty. We've had a history, though, of sort of narrowing rights, cancelling commercial rights in the NRTA areas, merging and consolidating rights by courts, and things that are not appropriate in treaty relationships and relationships of kinship. Um, what I think you can take from Anishinaabe understandings of the treaty and where the, our starting point today is that these concepts of renewal and respect and reciprocity are core understandings of how the treaty relationship needs to be, um, needs to be looked at uh, from a modern perspective. I think there's things that have muddled that and that's the continued um, very uh, greedy objective of land and resource acquisition. 
and profit from resources. And that's something that we need to uh, deal with in our, our contemporary uh, implementation of treaty understandings. In a lot of cases, um, there has been a real push towards consultation and accommodation as the duty of the Crown in law to um, try and minimize impacts on treaty and Aboriginal rights. And that's kind of taken a very procedural bent uh, to it. And in some cases, we've actually um, really um, created this, this technocratic or administrative burden around treaty recognition. Um, you know, what is the micro-focused right at play? And what is the micro-focused activity? And is the activity gonna impact the right in a way that's so significant that it needs to be accommodated or that it would constitute an infringement? And to me, those are not words of relationship. They're absolutely uh, not a reflection of what was agreed to in the making of treaty and the building of the relationship that was to share land, be in relationship, practice uh, concepts of renewal, respect, and reciprocity. And I can say that those are those the, the core concepts because we modeled treaty making on the relationships that we saw all around us in the natural environment. If you look at, and I would encourage you to, to take this seriously, go out and be on the land and you'll see that renewal and that respect and that reciprocity modeled in all of the relationships in the territory. Take humans out of the equation while you're doing that though, because humans are not necessarily very good at that. But we uh, are shown that on a regular basis and um, given direction to model that. And that's how we made treaties. Um, this little book, it's called Treaty Words. Um, it's a work of, it's a fiction. It's for children, but I think it's for adults too. And it talks about um, treaty making theory, but it, how we drew our concepts of treaty making and making good relationships from our natural world that surrounds us from all of creation. And uh, so the book itself is meant to be read together with children and adults and read, you know, many times. And the, uh, the character, uh, my hope is that she's, uh, people will see a, a, you know, a feisty young lady who's learning from her musham, but also be able to see themselves in, uh, in, that, um, in that character. And for that reason, she doesn't have a name. And uh, I hope that you know, people will, like I said, see themselves and, and take that, um, that learning opportunity. Um, I have, uh, I think I've, I've been very critical of the law. I, I do have some hope. And I think there are a few cases right now that many of us are watching. Um, we're hoping that uh, the Crown will honor decisions that have been made by the courts to respect Indigenous understandings. For example, in the Robinson Huron annuities case, uh, there's a case out of British Columbia called Yehi and the Blueberry River um, First Nation uh, has been able to get the court to recognize that instead of those micro rights and sort of micro projects, that if we're thinking about treaties as relationships, we need to look at a treaty right to a way of life. What it is that we talked about in our negotiations, preserving a way of life and how outside activities are gonna impact that uh, as a whole. So cumulative effects over time, all of those activities. So not just this micro project, but what's the state of the territory? What are the pressures that have taken place in the past, present, and also looking to the future cumulatively? Um, and how is that gonna impact way of life? So rather than two small bubbles, we're looking at big bubbles that are overlapping, cumulative effects, and um, the preservation of a way of life as a treaty promise. And I think that's a significant paradigm shift. I would encourage all of us to think in those terms now as treaties as, as meant to preserving a way of life, to creating a sharing relationship of the land um, in relation to the land and to think about you know, all of these cumulative effects over time and all of these resource extractions as um, breaches in non-sharing of the treaty promises. So right now that's the state that we're at. We have a sharing promise, but nothing is being shared and that needs to be, uh, that needs to be corrected. So I'll come back to one of my opening statements. We can't do away with treaty because it's the legitimate settler presence in the territory. The agreement is to share in the land. In some cases that's gonna take some more radical um, steps 
I think land back should be a conversation that everyone's having. Uh, I worked with the David Suzuki Foundation to create a set of videos to sort of introduce the idea of land back. There are many important conversations that are happening across the country about land back and different ways of doing that. Land trusts, uh, land returns, Indigenous protected and conserved areas. There's a variety of different approaches. Um, and I think that you know all of them need to be further uh, engaged as we move forward. Part of that is also resource revenue sharing. So thinking about how uh, the benefit and the profit from resources that are being extracted from Indigenous treaty territories are actually returning to Indigenous people, that the benefit as part of that sharing relationship and the decision-making about what kind of extraction is happening is very important. So it's not just cutting a half portion of a check it's actually about the decision making that takes place about what kinds of practices um, that takes into account that cumulative and long term effect. Um, these relationships, you know, are going to be locally and contextually based. I think there's a lot of energy around Indigenous and pr protected and conserved areas that um, we should be engaging with, not only in sort of pristine remote areas, but that land conservation can take on uh, different connotations for Indigenous people that are in urban centers. Conservation may look different than what sort of the um, environmental Western ideal has crafted around uh, conservation. It may be very different for uh, Indigenous folks uh, in different different contexts. So all in all of that, you know, there's a, a, a land back component, but there's a governance back component. And when I mentioned earlier that treaties are very robust relationships built around lands and waters and education and health. This has ramifications for you know, how we govern um, lands and waters, education, but child welfare and languages and you know, all of those things that are part of being uh, who we are, but exercising a way of life as well. Um, I want to, um, you know, we have a, a, a few minutes left and then I'd like to turn to some questions and I haven't been monitoring the chat so I'll rely on Denise to, to help with identifying some of the questions. But I'd like to close on um, an idea that's, that comes from outside of law and I mentioned earlier I do interdisciplinary work, but I really love what has been done in the area of health and Indigenous health in looking at Indigenous determinants of health. So rather than looking at Indigenous people as deficient white people, what is wrong with Indigenous people and their health, there's been a huge effort to try and frame Indigenous health from things that define health from an Indigenous perspective. And that's, you know, in part connection to land, access to uh, country foods, uh, language, access to ceremonies. And those are things that have been part of how Indigenous governance is being framed around health. And I think that's really important and significant. And I think there's an opportunity to look at Indigenous determinants of governance and think about how governance is not going to be divided into sectors and it's not going to be on bounded territories and, and geographies, that we can look at, you know, internation uh, collaborations. We can look at governance relating to birthing as an, an expression of territorial sovereignty and kind of redefining how we think about governance from an Indigenous perspective. And to me, the treaties uh, preserve that opportunity to define governance from Indigenous perspectives. That's confirmed in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. In indigenous institutions governed by Indigenous people in relation to their own areas of jurisdiction. So I think we're at a very important and critical moment in time where we need to be rethinking a lot. We need to be framing our treaty relationships in their original intentions of renewal, respect, reciprocity, sharing. And we need to uh, think about our relationships with lands and waters as belonging to them and working for them. Um, and, um, you know, revitalizing our indigenous laws and legal orders, um, you know, enacting some declarations and, and considering things like legal personhood or rights of nature, but framed in indigenous methods of recognizing the spiritedness and agency of lands and waters, and maybe even making treaties amongst nations as expressions of governance. And so there's a lot um, that I think builds on this, on these historic treaty relationships, and that can help to reframe what nation to nation might mean in a modern day Canada.
So I feel like I've said a lot. I'm sure there are some questions and uh, miigwech for taking the time today. And, and as I said, I hope you'll you know, take some snippets of this and, and have conversations with others and, and, and connect with land and territory and give some, some thought into um, you know, how to take up those responsibilities. So to miigwech. Miigwech. Wow. Yes, you did give us a lot, but in a very um, easy way to digest. So I appreciate that because I'm sure, um, you know, in a courtroom, that's a very different kind of language that you use. Um, so we do have a, a couple of questions um, and comments, I guess. Uh, so one person asked, and I'm going to put the word is, is there no such thing as crown land then? I, yeah, I would agree. It's um, land that um, that is part of the treaty. And as long as honest uh, relationships about share, how land is to be shared haven't been concluded, then the idea of crown land is a falsity. And elsewhere, I've written about the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius being uh, like deep foundations of Canadian law, but they're um, you know, juxtaposed with Indigenous laws and legal orders absolutely inaccurate. They presume things like that there were no people here. If you actually look at what Terra Nullius, um, you know, the foundations of that. And then we rest all of these structures of law on what are very shaky foundations. Like if you looked at two posts, you know, two pillars, mm -hmm. uh, doctrine of discovery, Terra Nullius, and then you build a whole legal system, including crown lands on top of that, get a big wind in there. Get, that's a shaky foundation. <laughs> True. Good question. True. Um, just a, a question. You'd mentioned the videos uh, on land back. Are those available? And they are. Yes. So there's a David Suzuki Foundation uh, web page, and I can go. Um, I'll just post that in the chat. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. And while you're doing that, I'll ask the next question. Um, so do we need to uh, dislodge uh, the image of the document as a public symbol of the treaty? Example, um, replaced by symbols of ceremony in the public mind. Absolutely, yes. Um, so I, I think there have been really important efforts at that. And I'm going to point to something that's been done at the um, Manitoba Museum. So they have a whole exhibit relating to treaties and they have uh, treaty pipes and medals and um, recordings of oral history, correspondence, all of the things that wrap around the treaty relationship. The written document, like I said, is just really an import from one perspective and it's a set of instructions from Ottawa prior to the negotiations. So um, we need to think about visible uh, imagery around treaty relationships and also um, thinking of the, the record, the actual record, the contempor contemporaneous record of treaty making as something very different and pull out elements of that. So I would strongly encourage you to think about um, the, you know, and, and look into for those of you who are interested at in the, the example from the Manitoba Museum, but also think of own representations in individual and community contexts of what that treaty relationship means. And I'm a, a big fan of art as a way to represent complex ideas. And um, I'll also share in the chat in just a second, um, the Nibay Declaration of Treaty 3. Actually, I might be able to just pull it up on the screen. And what we did um, in working, I worked with Grand Council Treaty 3 and the Women's Council. Um, and uh, we commissioned a piece of art to represent the um, Nibay Declaration. And essentially um, what it did was represent, you know, all of this text in one image. And um, I sat with an elder and asked him, you know, what, what do you think of this piece of art? And he spent, um, I would say, it was probably close to an hour with me explaining what the piece of art meant and how the granddaughter of um, this very important storyteller within the Treaty 3 region. Uh, here you can see it. This is, and he, he spent, um, you know, this, this, this hour explaining to me every single part of this and how it was a rep representation of Anishinaabe law and all of these different intertwining relationships that are connected to Nibe. And so to me, you know, like this would be more, this is a contemporary Anishinaabe way of representing that relationship. 
There are also, um, you know, some scrolls and, and different things that exist in different treaty contexts that also represent those relationships. But I think that there are modern articulations that, for example, this elder who's not necessarily an artist who wasn't asked to interpret this was able to tell me this whole story of this relationship with Nebe by looking at um, this one, this one image. Wonderful. We have Elder Gina Agizik with us who did our opening on Monday, and he actually would uh, like to ask a question live. So I've asked him to unmute. Um, Elder Jean. Yeah, good morning. Thanks very much. Oh, good afternoon. I, uh, very interesting topic. What I want to say is I'm a direct descendant of the Robinson Superior Treaty. All right. And what's happening is there's some renegotiations happening with the treaty in terms of land, land claims. And the indigenous people directly linked to that treaty are not involved in that. So under the Indian Act chief trying to, you know, eradicate this issue of land and money you know and we disagree with it you know like we have to establish that the initial treaty signing we don't want the province involved in it you know the province has the okay you know if we want to settle any agreement and we're overruled by majority of new members in the in the treaty in the reservation and that's a problem that so as an indigenous aboriginal rights and title do we have an avenue we could eradicate this problem you know do we, do we have to turn into violence and protests you know that kind of stuff you know we're recognized as as uh, you know, indigenous rights in the United Nations and PRC wants to ratify these agreements. So we want our elders, direct descendants of that treaty involved and they're excluded. You know, so I know in law that the Indian Act, you know, will be the ruling power of that agreements, not, not the people, you know, not the people that reside here. And I'm sure all First Nations <laughs> feel the same way. You know, uh, I just want to say that uh, you're a lawyer and I know you look at the Canadian law and constitutional law. You know, I just uh, remind you, you know, the tax taxing of First Nations in my community, we're, we're against it. And, and if you read the you know, Gizik versus the Queen, you know, there were principles in there that when I have an issue, you know, if, if I establish a tie, everything should go back to my treaty rights, you know, that kind of thing. I know it's a big long question, but give you know, me a big I, long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the question. I can also really sympathize with a lot of the tensions that have been created by um, being in westernized worlds and including the imposition of a lot of concepts through Canadian law that don't that sh that shouldn't apply. Um, like the, you know, in, in the Western Canada, the Natural Resources Transfer Agreement was imposed, the Indian Act is imposed, those are things that never agree. The provincial crown for you is like an imposed idea. And um, there's a lot that Canadian law has done in that rests on those shaky foundations I was talking about, right. And I think one of the, the important things is having these discussions at the community and nation level about not only um, you know, what we're going to do, but how we're going to do it. And like I was saying earlier, those principles of procedural law, like non-interference, not speaking on behalf of others, are really important to remember today in how we design our 
processes for how we decide really important questions, like, for example, um, renegotiations of elements of the treaty. And so I think that that's you know, essential when we think uh, or when we act in ways that are meant to honor treaty relationships. And I, I want to make one note, um, and I, you said, you know, treaty rights. And I, I think that it's important to remember that treaty rights is a concept that comes from, and it's confirmed in the Constitution of Canada, that there's a right in relation to treaty. But if you think about the treaty as a relationship and a continuation of a way of life, and the interference from the outside of that, the right is just kind of the legal mechanism that protects that continued way of life. But the way of life is what you're trying to protect. It's not a right. It's not a created right. Those are legal fictions, right? But you want to protect way of life. And talking that way and using that language, I think, is so powerful and significant. Um, it can change some of the, the, the paradigms that we're, we're working in. You know, that's easy for me to say because I'm an academic, right? When you're boots on the ground, there's a lot of really challenging atmospheres and, you know, situations that you're going to be in and, and really tense ones too. And I, um, you know, I wish I could give you an, an answer that had a ready-baked solution, but I'm guessing you would have hired me already 20 years ago if I had <laughs> the perfect answer. And I don't think any of us do, quite frankly. You know, it requires us sitting together and being in spaces of humility and working out the stuff internally within communities and nations, which is hard work. And they've, it's even harder with all of the colonial burden that's imposed from the outside. So um, hopefully some of those things, you know, are, are helpful thoughts. Um, and, uh, you know, reminding people of the original treaty relationship and what the treaty was meant to preserve as a way of life, I think is an important role for people like you. So miigwech for that work. Thank you so much. Um, just to switch gears a bit, um, how can I better learn the context of treaty of the land that I am living on? So wherever in the world, in Canada, that might be. How might one go about that? Yeah, it's different in, in various regions. I think there's a really good map and resources in Ontario for most of the treaty regions as a good starting point where you can kind of anchor yourself and you know, where am I physically located? What are the treaties um, and who are the, the communities and nations um, within there? And I say it's a starting point because it's no substitute for having direct relationships. But one of the key things too is, you know, in reciprocal relationships and in that I would include relationships of reconciliation, you don't want to place the burden on Indigenous people to be educating settlers, right? So there has to be reciprocity in that. And that part of that is doing your original learning, um, your initial learning on, on your own, right? And then not accepting that everything that you're going to read or see online is truth, right? Sort of validating that and, and, and thinking about it critically and also developing your own relationships with lands and, and, and territories. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I've, I often say is just be in community and be of service, right? Be of service. So find ways to engage with the community in ways that they want to engage, not sort of what you feel like you want to do, but sometimes stuff that you don't want to do, right? Um, and, and that's really important. And being there to listen and actively just listening. So there are opportunities to um, to be engaged as a learner. And that's a really important role. Every single one of us has to be a learner in various spaces. And we never stop doing that, right? So, um, you know, our elder has reminded us, you know, that, that, uh, that we all have this, this uh, um, responsibility to continue to think about what um, you know, what, what we import from the past into things that we do today and the, the significant responsibility with that and, and understanding also how that has been affected by external forces. Okay, you gave us a lot, that's great because there's a lot of work to do, I would agree. Um, we just have time maybe for one question and there are three, so I'm just gonna go to the final one um, about um, land back. Um, are the transfer or return of urban property specifically to Indigenous people through the TLE process 
It is often to existing First Nations for economic um, reasons. Uh, what are your thoughts on how this relates or impacts land access for non-status Anishinaabe people who lack a federally recognized land base? Oh, that's a, a big question. And I think that we have a lot of work to do um, in trying to understand places for non-status people within communities. I was looking at stats the other day and I, I, had, I don't have a head for numbers. So I don't remember the numbers, but I remember they were shocking in terms of how many children within um, First Nations communities are non-status now and how that's a trend that's going to continue. Um, and that's a you know, it's an explicit result of uh, assimilation policies by the federal government. Uh, so that's a continuation of those those policies into a modern era. And thinking about, you know, what do we want our family and community relationships to uh, to look like? I think that there's an opportunity to, you know, have um, reciprocity and relationships that are built between um, communities that you know, First Nations that represent people with status and urban populations that, be, that may be non-status in having collaborations around common spaces in, um, in uh, urban centers. And those are big conversations that have to, you know, that have to take place in very um, safe environments and, and those where we recognize uh, each other as relatives in, um, you know, and that's, wow, that is, it is a very difficult subject to tackle. And I had um, heard there was one community in Northeastern Ontario where there's no longer any status Indians in the community through this, um, you know, two generations. The two to... generation cutoff in the Indian yeah. Act, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So. And that was the original plan and it's still in place, even though there've been modifications to the Indian Act, it still hasn't tackled that core um, you know, I was having a conversation with a friend yesterday and, and we were talking about the just the absurdity still of how the Indian Act can um, set aside certain people um, from having status and, and create Indians as super Indian status for other people because of how the Indian Act is structured and it just mm -hmm. doesn't make sense and got, taking governance back around citizenship and identity is a critical thing that I think all um, nations will have to engage in in some way in the next um, in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. This has been a pleasure. We have covered a lot of ground in a really short period of time. There are a few other uh, comments there in the chat, so I'll um, encourage you to have a, have a look at those. Um, I would like to thank everybody who joined us today to uh, come and spend an hour learning with uh, Dr. Kraft, and we really, again, are deeply appreciative of the time that you've taken out of your very busy life uh, to come and spend time with us and all of the guests who've joined us today at Lakehead. Um, we do hope um, to see you again in person. And um, as travel opens up over time, I know uh, we have a wonderful law school here and I'm sure some of the students are on right now, um, but uh, you know, having an opportunity to, uh, to talk with active lawyers and activists and academics in those spaces, I think is really a amazing thing when you're a student. So I, I look forward to hosting you again in person. Um, for everyone who is on with us today, uh, we hope you will continue to participate in all of our upcoming events over the next two days. Uh, if you would like to join us tomorrow, we have Chief Dan Sawyers, Mike Ristol, Christopher Albanetti, and moderator Tennille Brown. We'll come together as a panel to discuss the Robinson here on 1850 Annuities case, which we just dipped our toe in today. Um, all upcoming events can be found on the Lakehead events calendar. So we wish you um, well and uh, walk softly. Miigwech.